I just have a few uh, short readings from the Word of God this evening. The first is found in the Epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 2. Just one part of a familiar verse. Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll read the first part of verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And then back please to Genesis. First book in your Bible to Genesis chapter 19 for not so familiar verses. Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that's Lot and his family, that he said, that's God, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. And then verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Then over please to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 and we'll just break in to read at verse number 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thy fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me. In paradise. And finally, please to John chapter 5, just for one verse. John chapter 5 and verse 24. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. That's all we'll read and trust that God will bless the reading of his word. It might seem like a few unusual verses to read in the gospel meeting, but I trust that what's upon my mind uh, will be clear um, before you go home this evening. Um, as I contemplated just the meeting um, here in Ballyclare over this past few days, I was um, interested uh, yesterday morning, as I would often do after I get up, um, I went on to the web page of the BBC and there was an article that um, caught my attention, rather unusual. A place that I'd never heard of before in England, a place called Hempsey, on the east coast of England. A beautiful place to live. But there was three houses that are situated just close to the cliff. And yesterday morning, they were declared by the council to be demolished because of a sea tide that was very strong on Saturday night, caused part of the cliff bank to erode away and suddenly a house that was 20 foot away from the cliff edge which would be about 6 metres maybe roughly the width of the platform give or take suddenly came within 3 foot less than a metre of the cliff edge just overnight and when I thought about that I thought about these two people that we've read of in the Bible this evening one perhaps quite familiar to us, the thief upon the cross, and the other, the other person, Lot's wife, in Genesis chapter 19. See, those three homes, or the people that lived in those homes, they went just from one moment of time of being in a place of relative safety to a place of danger, just in a moment of time. We've read of a woman who as she was making her way to safety, fell into danger. We've read of a man who from a human standpoint was heading for impending danger, but found himself in eternal security. How in a moment of time, situations and circumstances 
can just change. You know, what brought, as I read that article yesterday morning, it brought to my mind an article I read not too, not too long ago, maybe a little over a month ago, of another place in the east coast of England. I can't remember its name, but a similar situation. A man who lived very close to the cliff edge, a beautiful house, beautiful garden, but the majority of his back garden fell down into the, the ocean as the cliff edge eroded away. But the local council in which the area in which that man lived, they offered on numerous occasions, time after time, to relocate this man, to get him away from danger, to bring him to a place of safety. But he wouldn't go. 82 years of age. And he said, no, I've lived here all my life. I'm not moving now. I'll not ask for a show of hands. Who thinks that's a foolish thing to do or a wise thing to do? I'll tell you what I think. That man's a fool this evening. To live to that age, knowing all that he knows, knows right and wrong, knows what's safe and what's dangerous. To live in a house that at any moment could just fall down into the ocean. And yet he refuses the warning that's been given. Dear friend, the message of the gospel is a lovely message. It's a message of life, a message of hope, a message of salvation and forgiveness that you can have tonight. But there's a warning that comes with it. We trust that there'd be nobody would be so foolish tonight to not pay heed to the warning to refuse Christ and to refuse salvation. But when I thought about this woman in Genesis chapter 19, Lot's wife, we don't know her name. Interesting that we don't know either of the two people's names. It's not so much who they are or their family or their background that makes them stand out in Scripture. It's the choices that they made that make them stand out in Scripture. This woman, Lot's wife, She lived in a place called Sodom, a place that was full of wickedness, full of sin, full of evil. It tells us that every that all the people there just they just did what was right in their own eyes. They forsook the law of the land, forsook God's law, just did what they wanted to do without any thought of any consequences. That was a place she called home you would think that she would be glad to be offered an escape from a place like that. But not so. Here we break into the story as this woman's making her way with her husband and with her family. With judgment coming, she's heard the message from God that escape for thy life. Judgment is coming upon Sodom for its sin before the eyes of God. But there's one simple command that comes with the warning. Whatever you do, don't look back. But as this woman, I don't know how close she was to being in safety. All I know was she was on the way to safety. You would say, looking at it, she's left Sodom. It's behind her. Surely she's safe now. She's, she's safe now. She's away from it. She's away from judgment. She's left Sodom. She's okay. But no, she wasn't okay. She looked back. I wonder, does that sound familiar to anyone in the meeting tonight? I wonder, has there been times in your experience up until now where you've heard the voice of God calling? The Spirit of God has strayed with you in the past You know you need to be saved. You know how you can be saved. You know that your sin also is just every bit as serious in the eyes of God as the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. For the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. You know that your sin bears a punishment. But there's something just holding you back from taking that step of faith. I wonder how many times 
You've been brought to the wondrous cross that we've been singing about. Witness the Savior dying upon the cross with pierced hands and feet out of love for your soul. And yet, for some reason, somehow, you've turned and looked back. You know, it brought before me just a little illustration that a man told me not so long ago of um, a preacher preaching in a, an area and he was asking the people to come and there was a man that came along from time to time but um, he didn't have the best of upbringing involved in things that he shouldn't be involved in maybe he would have taken a wee drop of drink and one weekend evening he was out and he was found walking the roads he didn't know where he was and he didn't know how to get home some man stopped with him and asked him, was he okay? Did he know how to get home? And he said, if you take me to the cross, that was the crossroads, but it was known in the area as the cross. He says, if you take me to the cross, I'll find my way home. Dear friend, tonight, that's where we want to take you to. We want to take you to the cross because it's the only place where you're sure of safety not just for time, but for eternity. This woman made the awful choice of turning back. You might feel this evening that you're in a relative place of safety just because you're here. And yes, you're privileged, privileged beyond measure, privileged beyond any of us really can comprehend. When you think about the vast number of people in this world, seven billion people, maybe eight billion people, I don't know the number, scattered across God's universe and yet here you are in the little town of Ballyclare under the sound of the gospel what a privilege to be brought so near to salvation but it's just not enough to be here you have to take the step and that brings us on to the second person that we've read about we read about the thief upon the cross it's interesting when you think about it, just the events of the day, isn't it, in which the Saviour died. Three men led out to that hill called Calvary. Three men taken with, by Roman soldiers and nailed by the hands and by the feet upon a cross. Three men lifted up upon a cross as the people stood around and watched the scenes that took place. We all know the man on the middle cross, some of us know him as our saviour. I wonder, do you? We know that he hung upon that cross not because of any crimes that he had committed, but we know that it was out of love that he left his father's side, came into this world, allowed those men to take his hands and take his feet and drive those Roman spikes through. Allowed those men to lift him up upon that cross out of love for you and for me. But the other two men, they're totally different to the Lord Jesus. They're like you and me. They were sinners. Sinners condemned to die. And yet we've read of one of them. And he understood the reason why he was there. I wonder what went through his mind that morning as he made his way to Calvary's cross. He knew when he woke up that morning that this was the day he was going to die. Not too many people know that, the day they're going to die. But this man did. He knew that before the sun would set, his time on earth would come to a close. I wonder what went through his mind as he made his way to the cross. He must have, I'm sure, at some point hoped or at least longed for that something in his circumstances might change. That there might be somebody that would come along and take his place and that he wouldn't have to suffer the death of crucifixion. But from a human standpoint, this man's situation was completely hopeless. He was helpless. He had committed wrong. The sentence had been passed. Death was 
passed upon him. He was nailed, as we've said, by the hands and by the feet. So this man was physically unable to do anything for himself. He was powerless, hopeless, and helpless. And in a few short hours, the sentence would be passed and he would be passed from time to eternity. He would say this man's in sure and certain danger. It's imminent. It could happen at any moment. There's nothing this man can do to change his situation. But yet we read how his situation has been changed through one choice. A choice to accept that the man upon the middle cross died in his place. Dear friend, tonight, salvation is simple. God has made it simple intentionally. Because if it was something that we had to do in ourselves, some may find it easy to do and others may find it difficult. But God's way of salvation is simple. Through simply believing in Jesus, the weary and sinful find rest. I wonder, have you ever just taken the time to be occupied with the man upon the cross? Not the thief upon the cross or the other thief, the man in the middle tree. Have you ever just stopped and in your own, the quietness of your own soul, asked yourself, why was he there? Why did he suffer? Dear friend, the good news tonight is he suffered for you. He took the punishment that was due for you and due for me. And salvation can be offered to you tonight freely if you're prepared to accept the gift of salvation. Two people in two very different circumstances, but in a moment of time, their situation changed. One for the worse and one for the better. But just as my time is closing and I draw my marks to a, to a close, I bring before you the words of the first verse we read together. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If you take time to just contemplate those words, it's quite an unusual phrase if you think about it. If you were to look up salvation in the English dictionary, it would give you a definition of this. Salvation is something that prevents danger, loss or harm. So how is it that you or I could escape if we neglect salvation? Salvation is the escape. God's offer of salvation through the death of his son upon the cross is the escape that you and I need. It's the escape, the only escape from sure and certain punishment if we neglect Christ as Savior. Escape from what, you might ask? It doesn't give anyone any joy to stand upon a platform and tell people that you're sinners, but it's, it's not my words. It's what the Bible says. But it's not just that we're sinners. The Bible tells us that the sentence has already passed. We're condemned to die. The punishment for sin is death, not just physical death, but it's eternal death. That means to reject Christ as Savior and to pass from time to eternity means not to land in heaven, but to land in hell, where there is no escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You ask that man tonight, if you were to see him, that lives in England, that lives in that house that's just about to topple over into the water below. How's he going to escape? If he hasn't availed himself of the opportunity that he's been given to relocate and move, he has no escape. Danger is imminent, and it's certain for him. It's as certain for him, friend, as it's as certain for you if you go out through the doors another time rejecting Christ as Savior, neglecting, putting off 
the matter of your soul's salvation. You see, the thing about salvation is this. You can't sit on the fence. It's not a I'll do it later matter. A sailor saved or lost. To neglect Christ as Savior is to reject Christ as Savior. You've heard of two people this evening. You've heard of one woman who thought she was safe, but she found herself in a perilous place because she looked back from the safety that was offered. Dear friend, can I implore with you tonight, don't come so near to the cross tonight and look back again. There's only one place you should be looking tonight if you're at the foot of the cross. And that's in the blood-sprinkled hands of the man who was upon the cross. Look at those hands and feet and look at his side and ask, why was he there? Why did he suffer? Why did he bleed? And why did he die? And accept that it was for you. And you can be like the other man. The man who was in danger, just as you and I are, with wrath upon us, abiding upon us, while we remain in our sin. But trust Christ and be saved tonight. Go home rejoicing, being able to sing about the wondrous cross, knowing that the Saviour that died, died for you. And you can be saved. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, we bow into thy presence another time together at the close of our gospel meeting. We give thee thanks once again for the Lord Jesus and for the finished work of Calvary's cross. We thank thee, Father, that there is salvation vast, full and free for all tonight that would come to the cross and accept Christ as Saviour. We thank thee, Father, that even upon the cross thou art able, you thou were able to save one who came seeking for salvation. And yet so it is, Lord, 2,000 years later, after the cross, that the offer of salvation still goes forth so freely and so fully to all who would come. And so we would pray, Father, that there wouldn't be any in the meeting this evening that would be so careless, that would be so foolish to neglect so great salvation, but that they would go in for it tonight, make it a matter of priority, not to let this day draw to a close before they know Christ as Saviour and to know their sins forgiven. So we ask, Father, that thou wast part us now with thy blessing and take us all home safely, we pray, asking thee for salvation and blessing us in thy son's most holy and precious name. Amen.